Carl Hyacin has written 7,300,647 best-selling novels and is beloved by readers everywhere for his mordant humor, candor, and vastly entertaining stories and characters. His new book, a nonfiction look at his own love-hate relationship with golf, is The Downhill Lie. Benjamin Nugent's second work of nonfiction is American Nerd, the story of my people. It's all about nerds. Mr. Nugent has written for the New York Times Magazine and the great literary journal N Plus One. Ellen Hawley is the award-winning author of the first novel, Trip Sheets. She's worked as a talk show host, a cab driver, and a creative writing teacher. Her new book, Open Line, concerns a young radio personality who whips up a storm of controversy by asking her audience if the Vietnam War really happened. Dana Jennings is a reporter for the New York Times and the author of two well-received novels. His first nonfiction work is Sing Me Back Home. It's about classic country music and its meaning and power for his own poor rural New Hampshire family. The title page for this episode reads National Obsessions. Carl Hyacin, your new book, a nonfiction book, is called Downhill Lie. It's about golf and your return to it. Why did you quit? I quit when I was in college, so it would, I, I literally went 32 years between, between golf swings, and I was perfectly happy not golfing all those years. And uh, I quit. I, I guess I just, uh, I just sort of ran out of enthusiasm after. I wasn't very good, and, and that, of course, encourages the quitting. And also, um, I had learned to play with my father, who had passed away kind of suddenly, um, and uh, shortly after I officially quit. So that any thought of going back to it, I just didn't have any appetite for it. And I, and it was really there was no rational reason to do it. It was, it made me insane. So then the natural question is, yeah, why, why go, did you, why why did go did you back? Do that? Yeah, it's like, it really is like getting bridge work done when you don't need it on your teeth. And I, <laughs> there was no real reason to it. I had some friends who, old high school friends who had continued to play all those years when I wasn't playing. And one of them talked me into playing nine holes with him one day. And, uh, and I found myself actually enjoying it, uh, as appalling as that sounds. I actually hit a few good shots. And I thought, well, how hard this can be? If I can pick up a club 30 years later, you know, still hit a five iron, why not try it again? And then you get sort of sucked into it. And then, then I was talked into, when bad things started happening almost immediately, and I was talked bad, into, bad things. well, you know, just the usual disintegration of, of one's physical and, and emotional state on the golf course. And so other friends, so-called friends of mine, said, you must keep a journal about this. Because they, they were having great fun at my expense and thought the, the whole world should be laughing at me as well. <laughs> So that's two bad decisions I made. Well, don't complain too much because yeah. you've made a career out of people <laughs> la laughing not at you but perhaps with you. Is it, the, is it a book and it's sort of essentially, as, as we read it, um, about fathers and sons to some extent? It is, and it didn't start out that way because I just thought, well, I'll just keep a funny journal because any golfer, and even non-golfers, people who know golfers will identify with the pain and, and the debasement that, that comes <laughs> with playing golf. And, but then... Uh, I had to sort of get back to the origins of it. And my dad, and like a lot of golfers, men and women, they started with their, following their dads around a golf course. And that's what I did. And, and, uh, and I remember with my dad, I, he would hit, hit pitching wedges in the front yard. And I was playing baseball at the time. And I just had a baseball mitt. And, and I would literally play catch. And, and that's how I sort of started. And so I had to, and, and I, you know, when, you, when anyone loses a, a parent at a young age, it does stick with you. And I hadn't, Sometimes you think about it, sometimes you don't. But in doing the book, I had to do a lot of thinking about it because you know, all of a sudden he was gone uh, from our lives, and, and he was the one who had gotten me started playing. He was a very, very good golfer. So, um, and it becomes a little more of a memoir and a little more autobiographical, actually, than I intended going and in. And then your son comes into it Yes, well. my, my youngest son uh, starts playing golf, which completely screws up my plan to quit immediately. My plan was on the last day of the book, that was going to be my, I could just throw the clubs off the bridge and be done with it. My obligation was over. But then my, my youngest son and also my stepson started playing, and then even my wife 
And this was the big body blow. When my wife herself an announced she was starting to take golf lessons, I, I you knew and, I was. You infected. It was the over then. Yeah, family. I was done. I was cooked. There was no getting out of it. It's right. like the Pacino character in The Godfather Three. You know, they just keep pulling you back. What is it about walking around a golf course as a son or as a father that is bonding? You know, I, I, there is something to it. I think it's in the, the hectic world that we live in, and just finding any time with a parent where it's just you and your dad or you and your mom, and where you're alone, and you really are alone. You're walking down this beautiful green fairway. There's woods, there's lakes, and sure, he's swinging at a golf club. And, but whatever it is, you've got that moment with him. It's just like if you went fishing with your dad when you were a kid, um, and you remember those. It's like a sunny, bright spot, and... and where you can't really be doing anything else. I mean, he doesn't have a briefcase or he doesn't have a hard hat on. He's just he's just playing. He may golf. have a cell phone. The, well, these days, even that, yeah, even that's frowned upon. But you they do have cell phones out there, and I just for me, those were some of the best memories because it was really the only time, uh, often when that I had him all to myself, you know. And I think I think, and I've talked to a lot of golfers. I did while I was working on them, and they almost all start talking about when they started playing with their dad, and, and, and uh, it just seems to be a common thing. There's a lot in the book about um, personal responses to bad shots and good <laughs> shots. There's a lot yeah. in the book about embarrassment of one kind or another. Yeah. But there's also a lot in the book about technology of golf, which to a non-golfer is kind of fascinating. But you seem to indicate that it's kind of a scam in some ways? Well, I mean, some of the, if you turn on the golf channel uh, and, and if you're confined to bed for long periods of time, it's something you, you might do. And you see a lot of infomercials uh, for all these little devices that are supposed to help you, just like you see all these new clubs on them. When I was a kid and I played, you really just walked into a store and you bought a set of clubs. Now you're measured. They have electronic sensors they put on you. They have machines that photograph your swing. and. And it's still basically the same equipment, but it's you know now it's made of boron or something like that. But you also can can buy these little swing training devices. And one of them I bought was a little medallion that you hung around your neck, and it supposedly transmitted good karma into your heart and your muscles. And if you, and you can move it around, if you kept it in your pocket, they said you could also wear it, but only in your right pocket. I don't know what that means, but anyway, of course I took it out on the course, and I just didn't do any any good whatsoever. But Golfers swear by these things. They have cop certain kinds of copper, and that's the level of desperation that you get to when you play long enough. Is that you'll try anything? Do you do you feel taken advantage of? Do you think that the commerce of this sport mm -hmm. is somehow you know um, uh, predatory? Oh, not at all. Because golfers are just by nature they're 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 desperate and they're foolish. I mean, you'll, we will try anything. It's no, it's no different than watching ads for a new diet on television or anything. I mean, the, as a nation, we're all hungry for that one miracle, and golfers are the most generally hope, hopeful and optimistic group you'll ever meet. I mean, if you, someone actually thinks you're going to go out and play like Tiger Woods, you know, after 32 years of a layout, I mean, I'm, you're certifiably nuts anyway, so <laughs> what's the difference? I, I'm springing this on you. It's not in the book, but one of the things that occurred to me when I read it and when I've heard friends talk about golf is, Trying to speculate, if I think about tennis or baseball or almost a hockey or almost any sport, I can figure out more or less where it came from or what in the human animal mm -hmm. gave rise to it. This one, I cannot figure out. No, there's why, not. What yeah, is it? There's nothing in the DNA. Is it a survival? Yeah, there's nothing in the DNA that suggests that you know, any of our ancestors had to get a tiny ball into a tiny hole from 300 yards away. <laughs> right. It was never, it's not a survival skill. It's just, I think it's, there's issues of sort of, 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 of ego, sort of the vainglorious spirit of trying to do something exceptionally dif difficult for no reason whatsoever other than to say that you've done it. I mean, there can't be any other reason. I just want to read this one passage about the commerce um, uh, of it, where it seems to me that you were sounding a little more denunciatory than you just did just a oh. second ago. <laughs> a second and equally lucrative target was those souls who already played the game but did so in a mode of perpetual discouragement. Approximately 98% of the USGA membership. The industry correctly calculated that vast fortunes could be reaped if the average player could be persuaded that his or her score would be instantly improved by purchasing an expensive new set of sticks. 
Oh, absolutely this is opportunism true. of capitalism. Of course. I mean, it, I went to the PGA Center in, in St. Augustine. That, you know, they have golf, golf world. It's like Disney World for golfers. And you go, and it's all about buying everything new and walking out and with, the, with the same wretched swing that you had when you walked in. And <laughs> isn't, just, there, isn't there a guy in the book who purposely uses a sort of archaic golf equipment <coughs> right. in I order to kind of... Just show off. An old, an old friend of mine has plays with the same clubs he had when he was a kid 35, 40 years ago. And you just refute persimmon woods. Nobody eat woods these days are all made of metal titanium. And he's got the actual wood and he just, he's going to stick with it. And, and he it, plays well with them? Just the same as he did. He's <laughs> always been a good golfer. Yeah, no, no difference at all. But it's all in your head. I mean, that part of it was new to me because I hadn't been around the technology. There was no technology. Mm -hmm. Now you can get a ball with a thousand dimples on the ball. For what reason, I can't imagine, but it's a big selling point, a ball with a thousand dimples, singles The bars, whole book something. leads up to a tournament. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, oh yeah. And, and there's a good deal of, why do golfers get so embarrassed about their performance? Well, I think... In the company of others. I think poor, go poor golfers get embarrassed for obvious reasons, and like myself, and I hadn't played, and I, and first of all, for a writer, who, who writers, most of us are fairly antisocial. What we do, we go in a room, we lock ourselves in a room, and we and we write and so now to go out in a social situation where you're playing in a foursome with strangers and you're and the views are endless and everyone can see you every there's no hiding from it <laughs> and you're competing against these people and you have a partner who you have a chance of destroying it, it's usually first money is involved that makes it even worse so there's no upside to this whatsoever there's no reason to do this except you you, you know you're going to you're going to be one of the guys and you're going to join the tournament so my editor had said you know if you're going to do this book, you have to be in a tournament. So I did this tournament with predictable results. I had one shining moment, and the rest of it was a bloodbath. There's an obsessional aspect, sure. obviously, about this game. And in Benjamin Nugent's book, American Nerd, we read about almost a, a subspecies of human beings who are in some way obsessional. What is a nerd? Well, I say there are two kinds of nerds. And one is a nerd who is socially excluded for arbitrary reasons, usually in school. By arbitrary, I mean they spend too much time on schoolwork, if they're female, they don't put on enough makeup, et cetera. It has nothing to do with anything intrinsic to them. It has nothing to do with their mental state. And there's a second kind of nerd, which is a person who tends to be good at thinking in the kinds of ways machines are good at thinking. And they're good with machines, they're good with rational thought, they're good at following rules. They're not great at doing the things machines can't do which is to say uh, socializing um, activities that are more intuitive than um, rule following, than rational. Um, and so even though these people, of course, aren't anything like machines, um, they get regarded as machine-like and occupy a certain place in our culture. Are Some you, species goes too far. Yes, I'm yeah. sorry. That's a little bit <laughs> dem demeaning. I should say demographic, there a certain go. demographic. Are you a nerd? I don't know if I qualify now. When I was pitching this book, editors asked me that exact question, and I would say, you know, I, I, I certainly was when I was a kid, and my agent would jump in and go, he's a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I have agents a third will, party agents here. will do anything was, to sell a book. Yeah, I mean, uh, talking like, about the obsessional aspect, you make a tie between aus autism and Asperger's syndrome and nerdism. Can mm -hmm. you explain that spectrum, and is it sort of scientifically validated? Well, it's scientifically validated in that when I talked to Asperger's psychologists and I said, do you think a lot of the kids who get called nerds in school overlap with the kids who have Asperger's syndrome? I said, absolutely, there's no question. And when I said, well, if you look back at the classic nerds in pop culture, like, say, Jerry Lewis and the Nutty Professor, are those people acting asperger's -y? And they said, yes, absolutely. Um, and I noted that when, in fact, you look at Jerry Lewis and the Nutty Professor and Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man, the differences are, are kind of minimal. <laughs> um, but of course, uh, nerd is a, uh, a vernacular diagnosis, and Asperger's syndrome is a psychological <laughs> one. But, but wait, the differences between Jerry Lewis and the Nutty Professor, he's like hyper lunatic kind of person, and Dustin Hoffman is a repetitive echolalia kind of guy. Yeah, but the, where they intersect is in uh, the way they take questions literally, for example. Uh, when the dean in The Nutty Professor asks Jerry Lewis, you've just blown up a lab. How long have you been at this university? <laughs> Jerry Lewis gets out a calculator and starts calculating exactly to the day how long he's been 
and the way he moves and the way he mutters to himself. Um, you know, certainly I'm not saying autism and nerdiness are the same thing, nowhere near, but I think uh, you could argue that nerd has been a folk diagnosis for people throughout history who we would now diagnose as ha being on the autism spectrum. Of course, there are many nerds who aren't on it. Distinguish nerd, geek, and dork. Geek was originally a term for the guy who bit the head off a chicken in a, in a carny. Uh, you that. probably know that. Dork originated as a slang term for, for the male uh, sexual organ. And uh, nerd is a much more recent term. Um, but geek didn't start to mean nerd until well into the 80s. And so the connotations it has are, um, well, its associations are with Silicon Valley, with a certain confidence that I don't yeah. think nerd had because in the, the 80s was when nerds started to attain economic power in a prominent because uh, of computer technology, is. basically. Is that right? I mean, essentially? Yeah, and because the media jumped on Silicon Valley as this culture of, of people who are um, doing exciting things. Yeah, Bill Gates, of course, is like the cliched uh, version of how nerds turn out um, after high school. And, of course, one of the, that was one of the myths I wanted to dispel. I found nerds whose lives didn't follow the Bill Gates trajectory at all. Right. Well, very few lives do. <laughs> when you come to think Point taken. <laughs> so are nerds in... Now, I mean, we have movies and television shows about these um, peculiar, or at least to many of us, peculiar people. Or mm -hmm. I think they do. I think the idea of nerds is in more than nerds um, <laughs> as they actually exist. Uh, if you look at nerds on television, like um, the character uh, Seth Cohen on The O.C., which is played by a very attractive actor named Adam Brody, uh, this is a nerd... Uh, in a kind of uh, intangible sense, uh, in that you know, people beat him up and call him a nerd, but he looks like a million bucks. He has excellent social skills. His eye contact is amazing. Um, so I think what TV has embraced is the concept, the idea that I mean, TV is always like to root for the underdog and yeah. not really root for anyone who looks like an underdog. And this is another manifestation of that. It wasn't exactly clear to me um, how much blame in the book you put on our society. Um, for the nerds' tendency to, for self-loathing and how much responsibility, well, how much responsibility the exclusionary jock you know, sensibility ha has on nerds and how much nerds bring it on themselves. Well, there's a rationale for beating up nerds. Uh, and this is a case I make early in the book, uh, which is that uh, nerds have been responsible for a lot of the good and the bad of modernity. Um, it's certainly, um, in our culture, we give them that place of the person who have both uh, improved our lives and spoiled them. Um, Frankenstein and his miraculous ability to create a human being and the disastrous effects of that miraculous ability was sort of the paradigmatic version of how we look at nerds. Dana, were you agreeing? Were you? I think for some of us, or some of us have our nerd aspect and our non-nerd aspect and uh, and I, was also, I was also thinking that Spielberg and Lucas were definitely nerds when they were, uh, when they were kids. I mean, there's just no question to about the point, it. I'm sorry to interrupt. I mean, to the same point, in, on in one page here you say, the distinctive thing about so many nerds I've met is their willingness to pursue a dream version of their lives even when that dream isn't a plausible aspiration. Mm -hmm. So we just heard about Lucas and Spielberg who pursued the dreams Mm -hmm. with entire success. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, the nerds we hear about the most are the ones like Gates and Spielberg, uh, who I suppose we could say are, are living out of fantasy or bringing those fantasies to life. But I spent a lot of time with nerds who spent a lot of time in medieval garb um, on, <laughs> on fields uh, where literally 500 guys would charge each other. Uh, I, I and have seen were, them out there. It's amazing. It's, it's a it's wonderful, yeah. Wonderful, bizarre. Utterly. Yeah, and completely serious. Utterly weird. Right. And, and what's noble about it is that most of us retire these fantasies of being firefighters or, or knights or whatever when we hit a certain age or whatever our aspiration was that didn't come true. These people are happy to contain it in this physical space where it's absolutely true and they can find other people to maintain it. It has right. nothing to do with their professional lives or... Uh, what the outside world would accept as real, but they don't care. There's something noble and foolish about it at the same time. E exactly. Anyway. I think Don Quixote is probably the Don Quixote, analogy. perfect nerd. Um, Alan Hawley, your novel, Open Line, is also in some ways about obsession. Um, 
we have a talk show host, Annette Majoris, Majoris. Majoris who one night um, decides just almost on a whim to suggest or to wonder whether the Vietnam War happened. I'm curious, can you tell us a little bit more about the story? And then I have a couple of similarly obsessional questions for you. <laughs> well, starting, starting with the background of nerds, Annette, I think, is the anti-nerd. Annette is the person who can pick up every, every nuance in the culture and every, every ripple in the surface and ride the surface and never go any deeper than that. And the claim that the Vietnam War never happened comes out of nowhere. It really is a whim. She's bored. And she's tired of what some uh, call, her caller is saying. And, and nobody it, else is calling in. Nobody else is calling in. And it, what the hell? Why not? You know, what do we got to lose? She makes the claim and it takes off, which she didn't expect. And, um, and she, loses, she loses track of the impossibility of it. And she loses track of the fact that she did this just on a whim. She is a creature of the surface. And if people are believing it, it must be real. The other thing is that she's, she's heard by a guy who's part of a group, an organization that believes in all kinds of conspiracies. And he starts feeding her ammunition and information. And the governor of Minnesota, who, is, who has presidential aspirations, um, becomes interested and he backs it. All of a sudden, there are all these very important people who are saying this must be true. And how could it not be true? We have a radio empire that mm -hmm. needs to be fed money, and she plays a part in this. The empire needs to be fed money, and she wants to be making more money, and she, it's also, for her, it's about money, but it's also about fame. And that, I think, is the... Um, the addiction. The, the addiction, and the, the... That's the real American obsession, in my mind. I mean, I've, I watched a generation of, of kids I, that I know grow up with this sense that there is something real out there if they were just like they saw on the TV. If they were the least real thing around, they would be real. They would be more real than they are. And I think that's, that's a lot of what drives her, is, is right. this is her ticket to fame. As she begins to become more famous and better known for this idea, which she's always very care instructed to be careful about, never to assert, but simply to ask, mm -hmm. She begins to get hooked up, as you just said, with some people who are on the fringe and who are somewhat obsessional themselves. Who are they? And how widespread do you think as a social phenomenon this is here? The, the sense that there, are, um, that there are conspiracies and that nothing is as it seems to be is very widespread in pockets, very scattered. Um, but you, as you start looking, you find people, you know, the, who don't believe the Twin Towers were taken down by airplanes, and they have all sorts of physics to prove this. You've got people uh, who don't, I don't know if you know, Paul, uh, know about Paul Wellstone's death in a, in, a, in a plane crash. He was a Minnesota senator. Um, don't believe that that was an accident. Um, it, it, it's endless, the number of small and large pockets of conspiracy theories. Uh, people never walked on the moon. It Princess goes on. Diana, the, oh, the, all, God, of, all yes. of Great Britain is consumed with the question of, of that that was that whole accident was somehow staged. And they know? spent immense amounts of money to just yeah. now in, a, in an investigation to go over what everybody already knew and yeah. then say, well, gee, no, we don't think it was, and they're not going to convince anybody. The Warren okay. Commission, no. the, um, yeah. the shooting yeah. of Martin yeah. Luther King. Uh, I, we do are do seem to be a society that does have pockets of obsession, but I have to say, in some cases one does share some of the questions, not in the case of Vietnam. Midway through the first draft, I sort of came to out of a, you know, this trance and thought, what, what, what am I doing? Were you doing the same thing she was doing? I, you know, in a sense, yeah. I mean, you know, where did this come from? This is yeah. completely insane. And at the time I was reading um, Stanley Carnow's uh, History of the Vietnam War, which is a magnificent book because every good conspiracy theory needs some hard facts to throw around, and that's where I got mine. And I was reading about the Tonkin Gulf incident, and I realized, no wonder we're all crazy, and no wonder we think that there are conspiracies everywhere, because the bastards are lying to us. Mm. And they are. And of course we're crazy. So, you know, yes, we can't believe anything. When Colin Powell showed the pictures of, of trucks with cans, 
in them, mm -hmm. in the United Nations speech about ma weapons of mass destruction. That seemed to me a very, very odd photograph. It was a truck mm -hmm. with cans, and this was presented as hard evidence. Now, for all I knew, there, it, it was evidence, but it seemed like an amateur photo. I wasn't mm -hmm. quite sure why it sealed the case. When this whole business about weapons of mass destruction started and they started claiming it and everybody was out you know, sifting the sand in, the, in Iraq looking for the weapons of mass destruction, I thought, I have got to get this thing into print quick. Well, that's a good point because it's very timely, obviously a wonderfully timely book, or sadly a wonderfully timely book. Did you mean it to be a cautionary tale? I didn't. I, I just... I too got caught up in the momentum of it and I really didn't stop to think for a long time about what I was writing and what, um, what I was saying about our society. Um, Annette has an affair with, uh, a love affair with um, a very wealthy man but she feels unhappy about it. Did you mean her alienation from this connection to sort of mirror other kinds of dissociation? Or was that, am I reading it too symbolically? I think you're reading it too symbolically. Okay. I didn't mean it, I, it just that that was the relationship they had as I began to write it. And right. there's, a, there's a terrific passage here. Well, I think it's in there. I mean, sometimes we don't know what we've, what we've written. And I, I thought that her failure or their failure to really have an intense relationship in some ways was part and parcel of the distances among Stan and mm -hmm. Daniel and all the other characters who feel alone mm -hmm. in some ways. I think that's true. Uh, for myself, just knowing my own process, if I'm too aware of what I'm reaching for, I, it gets uh, very brittle. And so, preach, uh, preaching. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. There's a passage here, um, I think an utterly brilliant passage. It really um, took my breath away. It says, she's talking to her mother and, who is somewhat nagging and a different person and questioning what Annette is doing. And she's playing computer solitaire at the same time. Uh, that is, Annette is playing computer solitaire at the same time. Um, and so she's sort of half listening and half playing. And she says, and you say, Annette hit undo and the jack snapped back to its old spot, that the jack, the card in the computer game. She hit it again and the three moved off the four. If she hit it enough times, maybe the computer would unwire itself, jump into its cardboard boxes and styrofoam packing forms and ship itself back to the store. The store would return her money, which would be helpful right about now. I have to say the book is filled with so much regret and remorse in some ways that it felt as if that passage stood out to me. If we could go back and undo and put the golf clubs back and, you know, undo parts of our childhood. Wouldn't it be great? Did you feel that? I'm just curious. Did you feel that when you wrote it, or was it just an idle it was, it was a It was a whim. It was just, it just um, riding on the character's moment. Right. Radio um, made country music what it was. Right, Dana? I mean, and... It, yes. It, before that, before radio, it was... It was local. I mean, it was, uh, it was your relatives who could play, uh, you know, gathering at someone's house or, uh, or, you know, the old cliche of sitting on the porch with the guitar and the fiddle, and uh, it, was, it was local entertainment. Then what happened when radio was freely and more fully available? They needed, you know, like any medium, they needed to, uh, to fill time, and uh, they found... You know, I mean, we're talking, you know, back in the 1920s, that it was really inexpensive to uh, gather together a group of uh, local uh, musicians and put them in the studio and get them playing. And make some money? It makes some, make some money, yeah. right. I mean, the, that's the history of the Grand Ole Opry. The book is a very personal one. I should maybe make that number one clear um, because it's not simply about the industry by any means. It's about the connection between your own life and this music. Can you talk a little bit about how that works? I'd always wanted to write about country music, but I didn't want to do it in a, um, in a straightforward historical way. And the more I thought about my, uh, the, the rural people that I grew up among in New Hampshire, the more I realized the role that country music played in their lives. It, it, was, it was more than just something to listen to on the radio. It was, you know, sometimes it was a reflection of their lives, sometimes 
it presented a way to live your life. I, I set up a call and response structure in the book where, you know, I'll write about a, you know, certain subject matter, say drinking, and then I'll write about my uncle Lloyd, who who was an alcoholic, and you know, who's one of his heroes was Webb Pierce, and he would dress like Webb Pierce, and uh, you talk about is it there stands the glass? There stands the glass, right? Which is a famous song by Webb Pierce, but I always like Satisfied Mind. I'm a great country music mm -hmm. fan, and I would put that up against it any time. But it's a much less dark song than There Stands the Glass, and right. a lot of the music is dark. You know, I, was, I listened to country music as I grew up, and I, and I kind of joke with people that, you know, where some writers had southern gothic childhoods. I, I had kind of a northern gothic childhood, which, which always surprises people. How did that happen? I mean, it's not Virginia, it's not West Virginia, it's New Hampshire. Right. But it's Appalachia, you, you say, I think. Well, I, I feel that it is. I, I think people forget that country music um, is rural music. Um, and certainly a lot of its manifestations are southern. But um, it, was, it was our music, even though we lived in rural New Hampshire. And, and we listened to it. And you know, as I say, my, my dad and uh, two of my brothers raced stock cars. And literally, we, we would sit out on the porch on a Friday or Saturday night and, you know, and listen to Hank and Johnny and uh, you know, all, all of our favorites on the, on the record player. And the, the, you, there are themes, drinking, work, cheating. Right. And what were some of the connections between the music that you heard and liked and the things that you saw around you or the things in your family? Well, I, I think the reason that country music probably, you know, still speaks powerfully to me now and spoke powerfully to me back then is that um, when I thought about it, it seemed as if I was living in country music songs. Um, my... You know, my Grammy Jennings, um, you know, really never met a man she didn't like. Um, <laughs> and she, so if I, I listen to a cheating song, and you know, there's Grammy Jennings humming along to it, it's, it, it took on a gravity and a reality that other kinds of music didn't, uh, and still doesn't, uh, still doesn't give me. And work, the work songs take this right. job and shove it, and the, the kind of, Right, the kind of songs. Prote almost protest songs in some ways. Yeah, and, and, and one of the great things that country music um, did, and, and even modern country still does, is it does talk about work. Um, you know, and you know, Merle Haggard you know, is one of the people I really think understood the mind of uh, you know, someone who has to get up every morning and, and, and work at physical labor. I mean, not, uh, you know, not an easy job. But Started to, with 16 tons. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, 16 tons. Right. Um, yeah, the people, you know, especially in the 50s and, and early 60s, the people who listened to country music were people who had to, who worked. I mean, they're, as they aged, their, their back got weaker and their hands got coarser, and uh, it was a hard life. Hmm. There's an there's a, a astonishing passage here um, about uh, the factory, I think, where you, your father and, and you yeah. worked. Mm -hmm. called Kingston Steel Drum. Right. Um, and it says, Kingston Steel Drum skulked in a sand pit off Route 125 and poisoned my hometown for decades. The factory handled paint drums and insecticide drums, peanut butter drums and shampoo drums, acids and solvents, oil and raw alcohol, which some of the men would cut with Sprite or ginger ale and then drink. There were drums foul with chemicals whose names we couldn't begin to pronounce but we all understood the skull and crossbone stickers plastered on the sides. That was the reality of labor as you knew it then. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I feel really lucky to have the, uh, you know, the, the childhood and late adolescence that I had. But, I mean, getting to work at a place by, like Kingston Steel Drum, while when it was happening, you know, especially for my dad, um, it wasn't great, but you know, I, I just feel like I understand something about the, uh, you know, the dark side of the American dream that most, po you know, most people don't. And you see that a lot in country music. You read songs in some ways that, maybe you could give an example, of famous songs that have this dark undercurrent that most people don't get. You know, I like, I like the dark stuff. <laughs> And go ahead, Ben. Oh, I was I was just saying, you know, what always seemed so universal about it to me is the way country music was so good at self-blame. 
that like Merle Haggard and Johnny Cash, really? um, you know, are very into saying things are their own fault. And I, I, I always wondered if, if that was what made it so. so Mama universal. tried. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mama right. tried is a perfect right. example. Yeah. Right. This 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 kid who went wrong, but he says his mother tried, but it didn't make any difference. You, you know, I, I think it's almost it's a healthy fatalism. <laughs> Um, is that why it's not more popular everywhere in America? Why is country music somewhat ghettoized, even though it's the most, I should point out, right, it's right, the best-selling music in the world. Right. Lots of us look down on it. It's lots too, of people. too raw, I think. I think, you think it's too hard to don't handle. want to hear it. I think real country, real country music is, but I also think there's a pop country music. It, right. If you're switching channels and you get on country music, it's nothing like what you write. It's much more, not even like rock and roll, but it's almost in... in in Brittany world, some of it is these days. Yeah, I, I mean, it makes it makes me laugh now that uh, you know country music has boy bands now. You, you know, like a band <laughs> like Rascal Flatts uh, or Emerson Drive or even even Keith Urban. I mean, they're they're pretty boys. You, you know, God, if uh, if Ernest Tubb had seen Keith Urban in Nashville in 1955 right. at Tootsie's Orchid Lounge, he, he would have laughed at him. Right. You know, he you know he. He would have had to have left town. But do you think that Ellen's right? Do you think that even to this day, or especially with classic country music, because I, I agree, I think that there are raw elements. I think that Toby Keith's music, although it's sort of mischievous and scampy and highly popularized, it has an edge to it, right. whether it's jingoistic or personal, that well, I think lots of people don't want to deal with. Well, it, there's still the class issue. I mean, there, there's still uh, absolutely the class issue. and. Uh, and certainly classic country music was originally made by poor people for poor people. And, you know, it started selling better into the 60s. But that was when, you know, the, the Nashville producers started sweetening it up a little bit. Um, you know, trying to move it uptown. Violins, not fiddles. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, right. And sometimes that worked. I mean, someone like Patsy Cline, who, who really had a, a pop country voice, um, you know, it was perfect for her to have that kind of Nashville sound setting. But it was still aching. It's still an aching voice. Oh, right, and it would cut. It actually would cut through sometimes the you know the over the over plushness. But you know, it, to, to me, one of the things about America is that as much as we like to talk about our classless society, which you know I can't complain about. You know, my parents have eighth grade educations, and I work for the New York Times. You know, so. Something works, right? But it makes us uncomfortable. It really to makes confront us, that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it makes mm -hmm. us uncomfortable, and and the best country music makes us confront those class issues. Right. What did Elvis Presley and um, Johnny Cash do, and the Everly Brothers? They were great. You know, Elvis always wanted to be a pop singer. I mean, you know, he started as a country singer. You, you know. You know, we had more 45s in my house by Elvis because my, uh, my mother was a 17-year-old girl in 1957. And, you know, and so she was an Elvis fan. Um, the Everly Brothers, I don't think what they did was a bad thing. They, they you know, they, they came from a real country background. And as I say in the book, I feel like an act like the Everly Brothers really paved the way for... Uh, for later bands like like the Eagles, I mean, I mean there's no there's no Eagles without the Everly Brothers. Um, there's no Eagles without Glenn Campbell. Right. Um, but it's un, but it's inevitable that as the music using these cat catalysts grows more popular, it does lose some of its. I hate to use the word authenticity. Right. Or or, or rough edges. Rough. Edges. I, I mean, what what a corp. What happens? To any musical style that that starts is it's it's often wild and raw and its beginnings and as it progresses the people who want to make money from it not necessarily musicians they start sanding it mm -hmm. you, you know it's, uh, it's you, you know it's like how in the 60s and into the 70s someone could be characterized as being too country which you know when I hear that phrase and, and you still you still can hear the phrase oh, yeah. now it it just makes me bristle the idea that a country musician can be, you know, too country. Funny you were saying it because a lot of uh, the, the, every year Golf Digest does the thing of the best celebrity golfers, for whatever reason, and and so you can read about all the, your favorite singer, your favorite whatever, and every year the top the best golfers are country music 
performers. Every uh, right at the top. I mean, some of them could be pros. They're so good. It's also an old-fashioned way of saying I've made it. You know. It's yeah, like, that's true it's too. Like, mm -hmm. By God, I belong to the country club, and I can, you know, I can kick your ass. But when I was in high school, and we certainly had the, you know, the nerd. We call them dweebs. I don't know what the difference between a nerd <laughs> and a dweeb is, but whatever it is. I don't think we have. Well, but there is time there are rural issues there. I mean, it was yeah. we were out in the literally out in the, ever, the edge of the Everglades. And so if, it, when someone came in, and I remember distinctly a, a kid one of my class, one of my geology, I mean, he was like a, a whiz. A, a, I mean, he knew more about geology than all of us did, and we grew up in, but he was, he was the nerd. He was the dweeb. He was, I mean, but again, that was a class comment on our part. I mean, it was, it was, it was our outlook that not, he was just not different. He was smarter, he was sharper, and he was there for, in a, he had to be in a different class than, uh, and not necessarily something that we regarded highly. You know, we were like all high school kids. Yeah, I, th I think uh, golf and nerdiness are both fraught in terms of American ideas of upward mobility. <laughs> upward mobility. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know that. Uh, um, you know, one of the reasons Americans are so ambivalent about nerds is because mm -hmm. nerds kind of exemplify what you have to do to be upwardly mobile. You have to work really hard and not think of, not be well rounded. Mm -hmm. Usually. Yeah, there's another distinction yet again, which is a grind. A grind versus a nerd, what used to right. be called a grind. Right. And you make that distinction, I think. They're not always the same. Right, well, greasy grind, when it uh, became popular as a term in the early 20th century, had overtones of, of immigrant, of, of, of Jew, mm -hmm. often. Right. Right. Uh, and then it kind of lost its ethnic connotations when it became nerd, that's right. right. And I think the upward mobility issue, um, I think something new has been grafted onto that in the last, I don't know, a couple of decades probably, which is this desire for celebrity and fame. I want to see myself out there. And that, I think, is what, um, what I stumbled into with Open Line, is that, uh, that sense that the only thing real is, is the image. Um, Robert Putnam wrote a great book about America called Bowling Alone, about a kind of isolation that he seemed to f find socially characteristic of our country. And I have to say that there's a lot of loneliness in, in these books and on the course and for nerds. Do you think that's true? And especially on the radio with yeah. the call-in people. Well, there's a difference yeah. between loneliness and aloneness. And I think for writers, a lot of our loneliness is chosen. We, you, you make mm -hmm. the decision. We work alone. It's not a committee. You go in a room or you're on a newspaper story and you, you got a column to write, nobody's going to help you. I mean, you just learn to be alone, and it's not the lonely feeling. But I do think there, there are places of sort of solitude and refuge if you're working on a computer. Um, I mean, you, you can't reprogram a computer with a whole committee of people behind you. There are things that we do alone, and I think we're more comfortable being alone than some cultures are. The aloneness that I'm dealing with in Open Line, I think, is not is not that aloneness. It really is loneliness. It's the loneliness of when you're not, when you're not the person you really are and you have no idea who, that, who you would be if you were yourself. You can't help but be alone. I mean, there's, well, a late night caller, the phenomenon, even listening to that, which you do if you're driving, you turn it in, there's almost a macabre curiosity about who are these people, where are they calling from, and what possesses them, and you get a, a conspiracy theory going, and then you mm -hmm. fully understand how they gain momentum, how the UFO phenomenon in this country, uh, it, you know, every time there's a, a bright light, every, oh no, that's what it had to be. I used to do a uh, radio show, radio call-in show, and actually there is an odd sort of community that forms. I used to get repeat callers, yeah, and I, you know, I knew them and they knew me, and we all sort of knew what the relationship what was going to be. What did you think about them? I mean, how did you feel about them? You were glad they called. <laughs> Very mixed. I mean, some of them were a lot of fun, and some of them were full of life, and uh, and I really enjoyed them. Some of them were. Some of them asked good questions. Uh, some of them didn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was. Um, it got pretty slow some nights. Right. Oops. Right. Well, <laughs> that's very well conveyed at the beginning <laughs> of this book. I can see why she was trying to juice it up a little yeah. bit. Well, you know, Carl mentioned the UFO people, and I remember in. In my hometown, there was a famous woman named Betty Hill, and she swore that she was abducted by um, by a flying saucer, and, and it just it made all of us wonder just you know what kind of loneliness makes you make that claim so that you know you're, you're going to appear in the Globe or maybe in the old version of the Enquirer. And um, one of the phenomena that fascinated me in recent years, and it, it's something like I think it touches on your book is. 
the, the uh, people who claim to be survivors of 911 and are not survivors. And I'm not talking mm -hmm. about the people that are doing it to file lawsuits or to get money, but just telling people, oh, I was there or mm -hmm. I, I got out of the building. And they, and they, they didn't. Yeah. And, but they've built a whole life and, and to the point where some of them almost believe that they were. And mm -hmm. that's a... It's not, that's not hard, that's not hard to, to understand. I, you can fabricate things, but that's a pretty intense fabrication. Oh, in detail. I mean, and, and yeah. they give accounts to their hometown newspapers and the newspapers mm -hmm. don't always check it out, as we know. And, and then you, the calls come in saying, wait a minute, they didn't work for this mm -hmm. company and they weren't on my floor. And, I, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden... But I mean, the, the idea of taking it to that, that's not just saying, you know, the Russians killed Kennedy or a Cuban, the Cuban, Oswald worked for the Cubans. This is, no, I was there and I escaped. And it's making yourself more important. It's making you something you're not. Because we have perhaps a celebrity culture. Right. Well, and I think that's why it's so important to have Merle Haggard on the radio, <laughs> is that when people can hear voices out there in the popular culture that say, mm -hmm. I too am, you know, bereft and my life isn't what I wanted it to be and I'm not a glamorous person you're not as lonely in your imperfection. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think mm -hmm. we have this, everyone's aspiring to be heroic in this way. Right. Perhaps they wouldn't feel so pressured to be if the popular culture didn't right. insist that everybody right. presented would look right. like and, an Olympian. And then know? we have the artificial celebrity. If celebrity isn't artificial by itself, there's an idea of artificial celebrity in reality shows, which seems to be like <laughs> another level above <laughs> artifice. What the old country musicians did is that they tried to flip that around is that they would, at least for some of them was an act, but still when, when they were doing a show, they would try to bring themselves down to the level of their fans. And, rather, to, make, and to make ordinary life heroic. Mm -hmm. Right, they, they just, they didn't, you know, they liked having the perks, they liked having the, the nice house and the outskirts of Nashville right. and the Cadillacs, you know, you had to have a Cadillac. But um, <laughs> but that in itself is almost an admission <laughs> of of who you are. But right. it was it was just very important to say you know, Dan, you know, you're just a regular guy the way I am, or I'm just a regular guy the way you are, and I just got a little bit lucky, and that's why I'm up here. Right. Mm -hmm. And that to some extent, country musicians still do do that, yeah. and it's a big difference between other kinds of popular music and country musicians. Been to Nashville many times, yes. and I've seen. It may be just a legacy at this point, but they are assiduous right. in being close to their fans. Yeah. I was going to say, it was really sad for me to watch um, hip hop, I mean, this is more of my generation, go right. from being something in the 80s when I was a little kid that was all about being poor um, and, yeah. and kind of celebrating like the poor conditions you were growing up in some right. ways to being something that was so much about being Nova Rich <laughs> um, and, and you know, about the unacceptability of, of not being rich. Uh, you said something earlier about things starting on the edge and being then brought into the center as much right. of country music is. When there's a buck to be made, something happens to mm -hmm. the raw originality. And the real life is on the edge, and that's where the creativity is, and that's where the, that's where the culture has its yeah. most power. And you bring it into the middle, and you sand the edges off, and you begin to lose that power, and it, it's one of the real also, ironies. That's why so often in music, you know, in pop music anyway, and I'll include all the genres, the first hit that a person has is often the best song right. that they ever sing. I mean, mm. I, th I think of like Jeannie C. Riley with um, Harper Valley Harper PTA. Valley, PTA yeah. She never, she never came close right. to uh, equaling that again, but she was young and hungry and ticked off, and she just nailed that song. Right, right. Well, I'm, I thank you all for coming here, and a lot of food for thought, all four books I think if you read them all, you feel as if you've visited a lot of um, uh, secret places in America, uh, places that some of us don't know about and should. And I, I, it was a great privilege to talk to you all, and I, I thank you. And I will say, as we usually say when we finish up an episode, please keep reading. <laughs>